giving you a voice, making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First Updates Now is able to create content thanks to viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Well, wow, that looks like an amazing game. I hope everyone's really excited. So now we have an Ask Me Anything session with some great referees from around the world. And maybe each of the referees can introduce themselves. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Hi, everyone. My name's Steve Scher, and I'm the head referee in the Virginia, D.C. region, and uh, one of the World Festival head referees and an advisor to referees around the world. So I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing the replay season with y'all and learning about uh, what you find interesting and uh, uh, see what we can do with it together. Thanks. Well, hello, everyone. My name is David Stoltz. I'm from Houston, Texas. Uh, I've been around first for a number of years in all roles from coaching to event staff and refereeing. I uh, work with Steve and others at the World Festival level. Uh, very excited to see what inspires us this season. We've got a lot to be inspired by and a lot of reasons to be inspired. So uh, looking forward to seeing what the teams come up with. Hi, I'm Jeff Locke. I'm the head referee for Ontario, Canada, uh, right on the border with Michigan. Uh, I've been involved since 2005. I also coach uh, FLL and FRC teams, and I'm looking forward to seeing what everybody has in store this season. Hi, everybody. My name is Carol Connor. I am the head referee for the West Florida region, and I've been involved with FIRST for about 11 years now, I guess, both as a coach and a tournament director, all kinds of things. And I think this is my sixth year as head ref in West Florida, and I'm very excited to get started on this season. Great. Thanks to you all for being here. So let's start off with a simple question that, uh, that uh, for a lot of beginner teams. What does a typical run look like? What do they have to do? And how do they interact with the referees? Well, I can start with that. <clears throat> uh, your interaction with the referees is uh, part of the excitement of being at a tournament. And if we do remote uh, tournaments this year, it'll be a little bit different, but you'll still get a chance to uh, correspond back and forth. Uh, when you come to a, the table, the first thing you're going to do is uh, take all of your equipment, all the things you bring, including the robot and any other pieces you may have built, and you're going to put them in one of the inspection areas for the referee to look at. Uh, there's a bonus for putting everything in the small inspection uh, space, so we expect most teams will do that, but that's totally up to you. Once the referee gives you the okay, then you'll start setting your uh, robot, your equipment, and any mission models that start in the home area up for your first run. And there's a countdown typically, and uh, something like three, two, one, Lego. And that when that first word, or when that last word starts being said, you can start and run your missions in any order, uh, in any program. You can rerun things if you can do it uh, without having to reset the field. And after two and a half minutes, you stop your robot, and you and the referee will take a look at the field to determine the condition of the field and what the score is. That'll be marked down on a score sheet or a score pad. And once you agree, then that's final. If you don't agree or if you need more clarifications, we always want to encourage team members to talk with the referee to make sure you understand what's going on. And if necessary, your tournament's head referee will come over and spend as much time as you need to hear what's happened and to give you a final ruling. So from a coach's perspective, anything to add, Jeff? Uh, I think it's very important that when you get to the table uh, that you take a quick look over all the models. And if you have anything that you want adjusted or changed, uh, ask the referee to do that. Be make sure you do that before. Make sure everything is there uh, because and everything is reset. Because if you have a model that isn't, uh, that can throw you off. So it is very important uh, as a team when you get there to very – to designate one of the technicians to be kind of your table checker. 
Again, it's good to bring, uh, there's gonna be two technicians that actually arrive and work at the table, but your entire team can be involved. So the entire team may stand off at a certain distance, but they can certainly help uh, look over the table, give the team, the technicians advice, uh, keep the technicians aware of what mission might be coming next, how much time is left, uh, and just be uh, a general cheer team as well. So get all team members involved at that table run. And I would also add that at the end of the mission, if, if you and the referee have some difference of opinion about how something should be scored, you can always ask to talk to the head ref and then you all can talk, talk it out together and come to a resolution. Great. So let's look at some of the uh, new changed rules. So Grad Dave asked this question. Last year, the robot had to come all the way back to home and then set up back in launch. Is that the same thing? And I know there's some updates to how launch and home and everything else work this year. Maybe you guys can tell us a little bit about what the differences are. Um, I would love to talk about that because I was uh, involved in doing some of the detailed things that made it such a problem last year. <clears throat> last year was the first year that uh, First Lego League Challenge had its home area where the robot uh, returns to safely being an area off the mat. So when teams put your tables together, you'll have a four by eight uh, foot area to play on your field and the mat will cover part of that and then the part to the uh, west, west side of <laughs> west side of the mat is uh, part of the home area. Last year that was all of the home area. This year, Home area includes all of that yellow shaded region, which includes that uh, quarter circle, which is called the launch area. So the team is allowed to handle its own equipment and mission models that are uh, completely in the home area at any time. And the launch area is only specific. At the moment the robot launches, it has to start from that particular space. Okay. So Anyone want to add to that or? That is going to provide a little bit different change this year on your robots returning. Uh, because last year when they returned to home, they had to come off the mat completely. And this year they can come back into that quarter circle. A little bit more area of home uh, to which returning. And uh, teams will options. be able to continue to work within that launch area. Last year was uh, once launch had occurred, launch area was off limits. Now it remains an active part of home or is part of home. And so teams can work in all of that area while the robot is out on the table. Some teams like to build uh, what we call jigs for aligning their robot at launch out of Lego pieces and push those up against one of the walls in order to make sure their robot's starting for the, where they want it to. And with this definition of home and launch area, your jigs are allowed to extend all the way to the south wall right near you or to the west wall across that open area of home, the part without the mat. And that's also uh, more lenient than last year's rules. So South Florida Robotics asked this question, what is the size limit? I know there's some changes to that rule as well this year. So I think the size limit is still the same. I, d I don't, didn't really, the size limit at measurement is still the same. The size limit at launch is different because last year your robot had to, couldn't be taller than 12 inches at launch and now there's no limit at launch. Yeah, I noticed that there's a uh, somewhat uh, ominous statement uh, about the height limit at launch. Um, should teams be wary of that? Uh, so do not abuse this by making tall, dead gravity hammers instead of thoughtful designs or the ceiling will be back next year. Is there anything that teams should really be nervous about? I don't, I don't think teams should take it as a challenge to use every single piece of Lego that they own uh, in a launch. Yeah, I guess the, uh, the game designers have a little bit of fun in some of the wording there. They do. So Scott Evans is the principal game designer. He's been the chief engineer for First Lego League for, for many years now. And he's a big fan of seeing robots operate autonomously and drive around and navigate. So if uh, robots aren't doing that because they're so big, they just have to sit where they are and reach out, he's, it discourages him. And so he'll react sometimes by changing, changing the rules a little bit to make that harder. But... Uh, not that I haven't seen a, 
uh, field in person yet, but it looks like there's uh, plenty of space to be able to navigate. As, as you heard on the uh, game description previous to this, there's lots of lines that can be used for line following. So uh, it, ought to be, it ought to be pretty straightforward for teams to have their robots move around the field and do different kinds of actions. So uh, Team 276 has this question. Uh, there's this weightlift mission, and you're supposed to uh, set the color of the weightlift mission. When do you do that, and, uh, and how do you go about doing that? It's going to be done before the match starts. So, uh, and this is one of the exceptions to touching the field by hand. So uh, the team members will go over there and set that particular mission model uh, by hand to the color choice that they've, they've selected. Some tournaments and some referees may offer assistance to that or may ask that they do that at a specific time or by invitation, uh, but that's going to be up to the teams to pre-select that before the match ever. Before you even tell your referee that you're ready, that should be part of your field inspection uh, that Jeff mentioned earlier. And it is nice that that mission is right near the edge of the table, so that can be a height issue for any of our, uh, our shorter. I'm always... Uh, in favor of our shorter people as being one of them, uh, you know, should, they shouldn't have any difficulty setting that if they want to set it, or they can always get the refs to help them. Yeah, I think it's always a challenge to reset some of those missions that are in the middle of the table, at least for people like me. We, we talk to the game designers about that every year as referees. <laughs> um, also from Team 276, they also asked about the the um, color block matching for the shared mission. Is that something that you typically discuss with the other team? When, when, when can you do that? Yes. <laughs> That's a vague answer in that, that uh, the, the, the shared missions are always designed to, um, to encourage some discussion with the other team. So uh, depending on your schedule, you might be able to know whose team, which teams you're going to be uh, on the other side of the table with that morning. So you may be able to go around the pits and talk to them and meet them. This is an excuse to some degree to make you go meet that other team in the pit. Gives you a, an icebreaker, a reason to go over there and and uh, maybe have, I was going to say shake their hand, but they may not be appropriate for this year. But to say hi and to discuss this particular mission as to what color you may be doing or or what designs you might be thinking about for your side. Because in, in this particular season, uh, the mission clearly benefits both teams. So it's, a, it's a important for them to discuss that and get a plan together. Okay. Uh, Lamarcus asks, so there's an update to the rules about combining things with mission models, and it's, it's based on time and not gravity. Can you explain a little bit about what that means and what the changes really are in terms of enforcement? There have been various forms of the rules about combining things with mission models in the past, and they've mostly been uh, designed to allow the robot to show its ability to manipulate different kinds of objects. Uh, the rule has been, I think, simplified this year to say that uh, some kind of attachment is okay. If you take um, a mission model built out of typical Lego blocks and you stick it lightly onto a piece of the robot, uh, it's okay. As long as when you take it apart, you can take it apart right away without damaging the robot or the mission model. So that, that'll represent a loose attachment to us. Now, if you cram something together or if you build a container and put like a Lego minifig inside and close down the container, you're not going to be able to rescue that minifig out of that container uh, very quickly. And so that's going to be an example of some kind of uh, connection that's not allowed. Let's see. I think uh, Ben Suda asked this question. Uh, if a robot destroys a mission model, what's the impact on your score? Um, can you complete that mission still? What 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 happens? Do you lose some points? Well, I think the rule the rule says that if you obviously gain advantage by the mission model or the field being destroyed, then you can't score it. I would say if something on the field is dis destroyed by accident and it doesn't really give you an advantage, then then that's not going to affect your score. The thing to remember is um, most of the scores are dependent on the condition of the field at the end of the match, at the end of your two and a half minutes when the timer expires. 
So in a case like the, uh, the pull-up bar mission, where one of the ways to score is just to drive under the pull-up bar, once you drive under that pull-up bar completely, um, then you've, you've scored that part of the mission. And if you happen to knock the entire pull-up bar assembly off the mat later, it's not going to change that fact. But um, <clears throat> if uh, you wanted to demonstrate, say, with the weight machine, that you'd move the uh, uh, stopper from the top to the bottom and you knock the weight machine over, then you really couldn't you really couldn't judge that anymore because the weight machine is not in its proper condition. So it's possible to put something in a scoring position and then destroy it later. Uh, so there's a, a time element as well. And obviously, I, I don't know, having been wrapped a once or twice in the past, uh, I'm always sad when I have to put together a back a bunch of information models. So, um, you know, I wouldn't encourage any teams to do that. <laughs> um, Grad Dave has a, has a question about the shared mission. Um, if the other playing team doesn't have any plans to do the shared mission, um, does that mean that your team would not get any points if they put a block on their side? Um, and as a follow-on, I think it might be interesting to talk a little bit about what are the interference rules this year and what do they mean and how do they use it? So interference um, is basically uh, causing the other team not to be able to score, <laughs> okay? So if you do something on the other team's field that gets in their way, that inhibits them from being able to score a mission, then they're going to get points for that mission. Okay. Um, it's not uh, intentional interference like that. It's not what we consider gracious professionalism because we want to see uh, other teams do as well as they can and we just try and outdo them by doing even better. But uh, accidental interference can happen and we've certainly seen it <clears throat> in previous years. Since the um, there we go. Since the score for the shared mission relies on <clears throat> each model having sent one cube over to the other field in a regular tournament setting where you've got two teams facing off against each other, that's what has to happen. If you speak with the other team <clears throat> and find out they're not going to try and uh, launch a cube over, over the wall into your field, then um, it'd be my interpretation that you're free to help them cause their model to launch a cube over the field okay, by activating that somehow yourself. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, especially because the last line in the interference rule says collaboration is okay. I also think it's a good time to bring up the age old um, adage that <clears throat> um, if it's not written somewhere that you can't, there's a very good chance that you can. Um, so uh, unless you see something that's prohibited, um, I think you should feel free to explore that option. But also, yeah. just to clarify, throwing the, activating your own model and putting the block on their field, knowing that they're not doing it, is not considered interference either, right? Absolutely not. That's a part of a mission condition, and it's uh, totally allowed by the rules. If the robot happens to drive over that cube, and trip on it, then that's not interference because it's part of a mission condition and you are allowed to do it. Great. And, uh, and if any and teams are worried about not having a, a team on the other side of their table, there is a, a scoring condition for that in case you do have a, a no-show or a, a robot that can't run on the other side. So yes, that's a good hint for new teams. Make sure and look at the uh, updates part of the challenge area. There's already four updates that have been published here on day one. That's where the rule about uh, not having an opponent on the other side and how the shared mission is scored. So those will update throughout the season, hopefully not too many times, but definitely look at those um, uh, every couple of weeks as you're, as you're working on your robot design. So what does that mean for virtual matches? NovaBot FLL asks about this. So in a virtual match, a remote match, um, your team will be playing on a field by itself. Obviously, you'll have to do all the handling, set up and everything yourself. And uh, you'll be uh, making a video recording in order to 
show the referee what happened so the referee can score your field for you. In this case, um, the update ruling is that for the shared mission activity, if your team successfully sends exactly one cube from the share model over the wall to where the other field would be, then you will score the share bonus, um, even though the other team has not, there's no other team to send a, a cube over. Uh, you will not score any points for any uh, virtual cube that could have been sent over but isn't there because it's not there. Uh, but you will get credit for the uh, launching part of the shared mission. And that kind of makes things equitable for teams that are in remote matches and if they want to compare their scores, hopefully later in the year when they're matching up against, uh, when they're comparing those against teams who are in um, uh, in-person matches because uh, just by being able to do the one action, launching a cube over, your remote match team will be able to score some of those points. And in an in-person match, then of course, both teams have to be able to do that. So there's more, more of a risk, but there's also a potential of more of a reward from the cubes that actually do get sent over the field being scored on behalf of the opposite team. And I suspect we'll have other updates and, and clarifications about remote matches where there's some special circumstances that um, we just begun to learn about uh, this spring with uh, the VOI and other virtual uh, matches. So uh, I think you could see a little bit more, more detail as, as people think through some of these missions and what the impacts of not being there might, might become. So speaking of updates, uh, so we do have four updates already um, for the new season. Um, we just went over mission update one, um, which was about the, the shared mission. Um, two is primarily a, a, a printing issue with the book, but maybe we can look at the other two and maybe you guys could explain what they are and how they update the rules. So precision token placement. Um, anyone want to explain what the importance or relevance of that is? Uh, I have the... Oh. Go ahead. Everybody. Uh, I have them here. Uh, just precision token placement, that's just to maintain consistency uh, and that your robot doesn't get used to using that space on the table because that's where it'll start. Uh, and we're hoping that nobody loses precision tokens or not a lot of them throughout the season. Uh, but it, they are they do start on the table, so they are in the way. So if you're planning on using that part of the table, they can uh, that can be a problem. So just to make sure everybody that one. And the last one is about dance scoring. It's my favorite one. It says we're going to use um, ultra, ultra, ultra benefit of the doubt, I think. <laughs> it uh, gives a little bit more explanation about, about dancing and, and shows you that um, basically if you're making any kind of a, 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 mo a dance motion and it even kind of looks like you're in the dance floor, uh, you're going to get the benefit of the doubt and score that. I'll take us back to uh, update three real quickly, just so far as a note for new teams. I've seen teams that uh, have decided for whatever reason, they're only gonna work on maybe one or two missions that are close to home. And when they set their table up, they only set up those missions. Um, and what will happen at a tournament scenario is all of the mission models may be out on the, well, will be out on the table and the robot's not quite used to that uh, and may drive in a certain place or, or whatnot. So you, you update number three gives us a hint that says, hey, practice as it's going to be. Uh, and that includes setting up all of the field to its full, full, full capabilities. I've also met with teams, many teams, who thought that the loss of a precision token um, is a horrible, horrible event to be avoided at all costs. Um, we do admire teams who are able to have uh, good robot navigation, uh, can drive out and drive back to home and be reset for future missions so that all the precision tokens stay out on the field. But if a team needs to rescue their robot or wants to rescue their robot and bring it back to home by hand, um, it's okay. It's part of the rules to allow you to do that uh, with the loss of a precision token. And <clears throat> if a precision token is worth uh, five to 15 points uh, and some mis mission that you might be able to achieve is worth 25 to 30 points, then there's obviously a benefit to the team's score in, in terms of trying to actually go for that additional mission rather than just not do anything more because they'd have to rescue their robot. For, for new teams especially, I encourage you to you know, pick a set of missions that you wanna try 
you should measure yourself against what you've planned to do. Can you accomplish the things you wanted to do? And uh, the score is just a side benefit way of being able to measure things to compare a couple of teams. But we're looking at how you progress against your own abilities. Uh, through the season, have you learned to do more with your robot to make it more navigable, to make it more, more capable of doing things, or even just to get it to move at all? That's a really good accomplishment for a first, first year team. Okay, the first time you get to do that, it's a real sense of satisfaction, even with a guided mission uh, that, such as we have again this year. But uh, definitely think in terms, not necessarily of the score as being the, the only thing that measures you, but, but watch, watch what you're able to do and the change in what you're able to do from when you start the season. And that should be your, your metric for discovery. I also think from a coaching standpoint, even though we're very early in the season, we're already talking about this score concept, the um, the day-to-day -day or the meeting-to-meeting -meeting never give up attitude because you're going to run into roadblocks all the time where you expect the robot to do X and it does Y. Um, building up that confidence and that tenacity to keep going no matter what is the same tenacity and skill set and attitude that you need at that two-and-a-half-minute match at the, towards the end of the season. Um, if there's still time on the clock, don't give up. Try again. So just a reminder to everyone out there, you know, this is a unique opportunity to ask a referees anything you want about the game uh, just type into the into the chat box and uh, we'll uh, ask your questions but in the meantime one thing I, I, I've been meaning to pick your brains on is you're very experienced referees um, you've seen all sorts of things happen and is there one piece of advice that you would give teams in terms of oh this is the most common thing that goes wrong watch out for it Maybe each of you can say, oh, here's the most common problem I, I encounter or something. Um, I, I, Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, I don't know if this is my most common problem, but it, it is one that we find uh, is probably the most upsetting. And that's when the team shows up and the robot is just about to start a match or partway through a match and the battery dies. And uh, either they don't have extra batteries or they, they need to charge. So uh, charging the robot or changing the batteries in between rounds is very, very important. And there's, there's nothing really worse than being partway through a match that's going really well and the battery just ends up dead and you, you lose all that time and points uh, for all that hard work. Uh, because really, the referees, one of the reasons that they ref is they love to see the robots actually doing things. And that's, it's much better than the judges sit in a room and they get to hear about stuff, but we actually get to see robots moving and that's, you know, not have enough charged battery can really affect. And Jeff, it's uh, been my observation that robots that are have a full charge and robots that, you know, have less than half a charge may behave differently than the team expects. Is that what you've seen as well? They do, especially when you're using uh, timing uh, instead of sensors. Uh, when you, as the battery drains, the timer will uh, go, will will be slower. So what you think takes three seconds on a fully charged battery might take a little longer on a partially charged battery. So. Uh, if I can suggest maybe some more sensors, that is a little harder. I would say another thing is to make sure, double check and triple check that you have your home field set up correctly. Because I've seen teams that have practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and they have a mission that will work perfectly. Unfortunately, it will work perfectly in the incorrect setup and they get to the uh, tournament and all of a sudden discover that they didn't practice what they needed to. You know, I'm a fan of the of the checklist and the plan B. So when it goes time to um, go from your home to a tournament or to go from your pit area to the table or even going from the boxes that you've contained up into the uh, inspection zone, have a checklist that you and it doesn't have to be a written checklist, but certainly a mental checklist that says, OK, bot attachment A, attachment B, whatever it might be. Um, uh, so that, and that's a routine. That's not just something that you dream up on tournament day. That's a, a habit or a routine that you've built up throughout the season. Um, and then the other concept is, is and it kind of goes back to the battery thing, but uh, if you've got a plan A, have a plan B, and your plan B probably should have a plan C. Uh, the teams who really do well over a series of matches can adapt to something that kind of went a little bit strange in round one and can change their robot or change their approach or change their human actions 
to to account to to, to account for that um, it, versus just being um, completely taken aback by it and then freezing and going well this is what we've we came to the tournament knowing only this uh, that team that really can really adapt and make some changes between the rounds are the ones who a benefit the most quite honestly but two also that benefit shows up sometimes in in, in the name of the score so um, uh, definitely definitely don't stop thinking and designing once you get to that tournament. Great. So we have a few new questions on the board. Let's see. Um, so there's more than one more than one option to end the game. This is a question from Sugiani. Um, does it matter which one the team does or can they just drive to home or is there a particular, do they have to drive home or just do one of these or? It's totally up to the team how, how they want to finish the match, okay? If the robot's driving back toward home or is returned to home and that's the way the team wants to finish, that's great. <clears throat> um, there are two ending conditions that score points, so if they want to score more points, they'll choose one of those. But just as uh, the strategy the team uses to construct its, its match strategy, you know, what part of a mission to do in their first run out from base and what parts to do in their second run. That's totally flexible and up to the team to decide. And that's one of the very interesting things for us as referees is to see how teams decide to do that. There may be a certain set of missions that we feel that almost everybody does, but they may choose to do them in totally different orders based on whatever works for them. The thing to watch out for there is that uh, if you achieve a mission scoring condition that blocks the way for you to get somewhere else. And I don't see too much of that in this game. There are a couple of places where things are moved around on the field. But uh, if you get in the way of your robot, then your robot in order to, to get past those might disturb that scoring condition. And uh, that's always disappointing. I would say too that it's uh, it's important on how you go about reading the challenge guide, and this is probably for new teams, but maybe rookie teams as well. The challenge guide gives you a list of options and things to do. It is not a recipe or a guidebook or an instruction book on how to get from A to B. That's completely up for the teams to decide that strategy and that approach. Um, so look at it as opportunities, and you may choose to take advantage of these three opportunities and not those seven or vice versa, completely up to you. Uh, mix and match. So Valiant Jin has a question about uh, attachments during a run. Where, um, you, you talked about the um, setup in, in the, the, the large and small infection area, but what about after that? Where, where can you keep attachments? Home. <laughs> Home is the answer. Right. Everything should be stored in home. And in home means anywhere over that space that um, we saw earlier colored in yellow, which is the part of the field without the map plus the quarter circle where the robot launches from. So you can pile all your equipment, all your attachments there, and you can handle them as much as you want as long as, you, as, long as they're totally within the home. I, I one, still see a little confusion point. in some of the chat about about home too. Also, make sure you look at the new definition of home because home is what it was last year plus the launch area. And backing up again to inspection, um, inspection is a moment of time before the match begins. Once inspection is completed and you fit either in the large or the small inspection, the inspection zone, the concept of inspection and inspection space, the inspection ceiling all cease to exist and go away. Then you're left for the entirety of the match of just using home and launch area uh, as defined. So um, again, once that inspection's over, don't worry about that part uh, at all. You can work in and, in and home uh, with your hands, that's 20 fingers, in home at any time as you see fit. So know, big uh, go ahead, sorry, Steve. Big go recommendation ahead. for teams is that one of your team members should be a rules expert, rules and missions, okay? Don't, don't trust adults. Adults make assumptions and, and sometimes they'll get confused about what's happening. And you don't want that to influence influence your game. But every two or three weeks, Go ahead and reread through the rules and say, is something we're doing not not allowed? Did we think it was okay? 
or what does this mean and, and what does it tell us? Is it giving us some more flexibility or is it restricting what we can do? There's not a lot of restrictions, but there are some in the rules. And if your team members are the experts, you can have multiple ones on your team, uh, but they can talk to the referee because there's nothing the referees like more than to discuss the details of the rules. And if you can make a convincing argument to a referee that your interpretation is actually what's right, then you're going to win that case during scoring. Yeah, and Steve's comment about rereading the rules is important because you may read the rules today. We've all scoured them. It's been it's August 4th. It's kickoff day. We've read them a thousand times. But as your robot develops and as your team learns new things about the robot, wants to try something, again, reread those rules, re not necessarily front to back, but we glance, we glance through them. Because something that didn't seem to apply to you or your team back here on August 4th may all of a sudden come to light way down the road when your team is deciding to do something new and innovative. And they go, wait, I think I remember uh, a, a rule or a mission point about that now. And, and, and then it's going to apply. Because some of these things that you may just read down, to just, they may just be a simple sentence. It may not apply to you. But as your robot develops into, and, and your solutions develop into something more complex, uh, you'll find that more and more of those rules have a place place for you. So reread often. So just one also related question. And, and I know. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. I know in my area, uh, I have a separate email just for teams that they can reach out to me during the season uh, in case they can't figure out a rule. And that really does help. So feel free to reach out to your, your referees as well during the season, uh, which helps with not every single question. Because uh, that would be thousands and thousands of questions. But on the on the ones where your team really can't come up with a concrete answer or agree, it does help to reach out. And other teams. So one clarification on the uh, storing attachment. I, I know this came up with uh, some teams I've I've met in the last year. Um, they were asking whether they can use a box in home or not. Um, and is that allowed or? Well, the things that they're allowed to have as equipment are things that are built out of Lego branded parts. So if they build a box out of Lego and it's less than 12 inches high, so it passes inspection and they can fit things in it, then that's fine. Absolutely fine. If they want to bring a plastic bin and put it on the field, that's not fine, even though it's not being used for any strategic purposes. That should be stored uh, under the table or off the field while the match is being played. Um, so we have a few more questions about the, the, the end of match missions. Um, so Sugiani asks, if we do one of the last missions as, uh, in the middle of a run, do you still get points for it? So, so it's scored, the, the ending missions are scored at the end of the match. So you will only get the, the points for that mission if that's where your robot is at the end of the match. So just to clarify for everyone listening, the, the end missions are the hanging mission as well as the dance mission. And so that's the ones that we're talking about right now. Um, a, a related question is uh, from RoboGirls. Can teams decide to complete both the game ending missions using the pull-up bar and the dance mission at the end of the match? Um, we don't believe it's physically possible, but we'd be happy to be proved wrong by a very creative team. I actually think it specifically says you're not allowed to in the rules, though. <laughs> yeah, in in the rules, it does say you can only score one of them. You'll get the yeah, highest. And score. notice the uh, formatting of the rules this year. So I think that's part of what that's one of the blue text. I call them the blue text uh, caveat. So don't uh, when you when you're reading a rule or a mission, read all of the text. Um, because uh, there, there could be some additional requirements or allowances uh, down in some of the italics or blue, blue text. Nowhere in either of those missions that say you can't do both. It just says you won't score both. So if you oh, want to try, do it. Right. Point. The <laughs> <laughs> but since the weight of your controller has to be way far away from the pull-up bar, it's at the end of the lever arm, and that's going to be really hard to counterbalance. <laughs> <laughs> now you're just putting challenges out there, Steve. Doesn't mean it's not. That's what it's about. <laughs> We have a question about cargo, and I know there are some uh, changes to the to the interruption rule. Uh, so this is from Ben Suda. Uh, for the interruption with cargo, can you clarify what the different cases are and, and how they work? Let's talk about interruptions, first of all. 
So an interruption is when you, as the team, interact with your robot or something that it's moving um, while it's running, while it's supposed to be uh, running independently and autonomously. So that can be by touching it, by readjusting its position as it tries to drive, um, by grabbing something that it's, it's pushing along as part of its cargo. <clears throat> Any of those are interruptions by you. There is a specific um, case cited in the rules that say, if you've put something in home and your robot drives through home and happens to encounter, run into that object and, and starts moving it, that's not an interruption as long as you're not touching anything because you didn't directly interact with the robot or something it was moving. You just happened to set things up so that it would pick something up. So uh, an interruption is, is when you interact with the robot it could, it could actually involve signaling a sensor. Um, and uh, so that's one way that uh, teams can have used to start their robot, but that's not allowed to be done while the robot's running without causing a, a need for another launch. So and then I'll take a stab at, at cargo. Um, it, it has changed a little bit. Um, so once you interrupt the robot, if the robot is carrying cargo and cargo is defined in the rule set, where you have to look is where is that cargo at the point of interruption, right? So if you're pushing something into home and perhaps the cargo has made it completely in home, but the robot hasn't and you touch the robot, still an interruption, but that cargo you get to keep because it had made it completely into home. Take the opposite case where the robot may be pulling something into home. The robot has made it completely into home, but the cargo has it and you interrupt the robot. Well, then the cargo is going to be in, uh, subject to, to, the, to the rules. And I believe the rules are once the cargo is left there, it's, if it's completely out, it stays where it is. And if it's on the line or, or halfway in, halfway out, that the, uh, the referee will take it. No, nope, sorry. The change is the team will take it, but lose a precision token. Right. So we have a we don't, go ahead. Yeah, we don't want things crossing the boundary of home because that just confuses things. And so this is an expansion of the way that precision tokens have been used for the past several years um, in order to clean that up. Uh, one thing about cargo to, to make note of is, as David said, if a piece of cargo is not completely in or is, is completely outside home <laughs> when, when it's interrupted, uh, the robot's interrupted, then it can get taken. And we want teams to remember that that doesn't just apply to the mission models that are on the table when you get there, but your equipment can be cargo if it's not uh, attached to the robot. If you're pushing something around, a sled or pulling a box or something that can be separated quickly from the robot, it's not part of the robot and it can also be lost um, if you happen to have left it in the field and then you try and bring it back. Fortunately, as, as was said, if you start with something and you interrupt your robot, if you start and out of the launch area with something, you're going to get that back, which will enable you to retry possibly whatever you were trying to do with it. So we have uh, one more question here. Um, Sugiani is asking about the innovation item inside the replay logo. Um, now, I guess, uh, does it have to be completely in or, or partially in? And maybe also defining what the replay logo is. Does it include the white border or not? Maybe you guys can answer that. Well, uh, I'll take a step. Go ahead. Go ahead, Carol. I think the rule, the it says it just has to be partially in. It says it has to be touching any part of either the replay logo or the gray area around the bench. And my interpretation would be that the replay lo logo does include that white area around it, um, but it's, I don't think it's specified in the rule, but it's, it's not the green area. So I would, I would interpret that as being part of the logo. I, I, I agree, agree with you, Carol. Um, since uh, the rules aren't clear as to what's a part of that, and that there's a reasonable argument for the team to make that, that that's part of the logo. And so a referee should allow that through benefit of the doubt. Okay, the we'll wrap does, up. Uh, does talk about the boundary being included. So um, I'd still right. I'd, I'd include right. the white as the boundary. Mm -hmm. so Go ahead, wrap up with this one very last question from that one guy who doesn't exist. 
What are your favorite missions this year? What's your individual favorite ones, perhaps? Or if you have something from past years, perhaps you can pick that instead. <laughs> My favorite ones are going to be whatever I see the teams uh, uh, developing innovation, innovative ways to uh, solve. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the bench mission, even though it seems like it ought to be pretty easy and it's close to base. I suspect there's going to be more challenges involved for teams than they first expect, and they're going to have to, to work with that in order to be able to succeed. I think the weight machine mission will be interesting, especially for the teams that go all the way uh, to the highest setting. Uh, my all-time favorite mission would be the shake table from NanoQuest, because we've never seen anything like it since, and it was just a monster for teams to deal with. I too like the uh, the team interaction, uh, the ability for the team to have an influence on that weight mission this year. But uh, I'm still looking forward to some buzzer beating, buzzer beating hangs from that pull up bar. So we're we're pretty much at the end here. I thought uh, just one last piece of advice. Um, lots of teams are going to have questions or come up with some unusual strategy. What's the best thing for them to do in terms of making sure this is you know their understanding of the rules are correct or their this unusual strategy they want to do is is okay or not well whichever region you're in whether it's a state or part of a state in the u.s or whether it's a country or part of a country outside of north america or in in canada as well <clears throat> um the, every region should have a head referee or somebody to be able to answer those types of questions for you so reach out to them first because your regional head referee is going to be able to answer on behalf of everybody in your region. There are other resources like the uh, uh, first forums that we like to look at and discuss on. Things you read there, you, you get a lot of great information there, but it's you, you can't show up with a copy of that at a tournament and say, this is true because it said so on the forum. You have to be able to explain it from the rules. Um, and then FL Robot Game uh, goes straight to the people at first headquarters and the really puzzling things definitely take to them. Uh, that's what I do. And uh, they'll send out information um, to the teams and the referee community to help people understand what to do. Cool. Thank you all, all four of you for you know, a wonderful uh, Ask Me Anything session. Uh, if you're watching live, make sure to stick around for our judges Ask Me Anything session coming up in a few minutes. Thanks. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.